Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Yesterday, I did a thing with the Royal Television Society, and on this screen here, they had a, a picture of me getting a BAFTA award from Princess Anne in 1990, 23 years ago. In those days, in 1990, I thought I knew stuff, okay? I was young. I, I have to say, even though it was me, I was quite good looking in those days, and I was very good at what I did. I worked very hard for 10 years in the 80s. I thought, great, I'm ready to be... Uh, 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 a parent, because uh, Sarah was pregnant the day I got that award. Uh, Harry's now 22, and I set out thinking, you know, I'm going to be great. And it all started to collapse very quickly. I'm sure a lot of you have children. Don't they ask weird questions, you know? And everyone says, you know, why is the sky blue? Harry asked that, so I thought, well, actually, you, yeah, I can find that out. You can look that up, you know, it's called the Rayleigh scattering. It's to do with... Um, the fact that uh, the shorter wavelengths of life, uh, of light, uh, get through the atmosphere and the, the longer ones don't. Um, and so that's why the sky is blue. Except that it isn't blue, because the shortest wavelength of life is, is actually violet. So it's actually violet, but our eyes aren't very good at seeing it. I didn't know that at the time, but I found, I found that out. So then he said, Dad, does God look after burglars? I don't know, I'll have to think about that for a moment. But then he said, Dad, you know, they say if you watch telly too much, you get square eyes. Yes, Harry. He said, um, why don't they make an eye-shaped television, Dad, and then you could watch as often <laughs> as you like. <laughs> and then the other thing that was an extraordinary thing, he used to do these things, I call them Y-strings, okay. He used to say, and he used to drive me nuts, quite honestly, when he was two and a half or three, uh, walking down the street to school or, you know, just going to the shops or something. Who's that man, Dad? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, Harry. He's just some, some guy. Why is he getting to that car? Uh, well, it's probably, he's probably going to work, I think. Oh, why is he going to work, Dad? Um, well, he's, you know, got to earn money. Why has he got to earn money, Dad? Well, because if he doesn't earn money, Harry... He won't get any food, and he and his children will all die. <laughs> and then Harry said, why do things want to live, Dad? <laughs> you think about that. That is an amazing question for a three-year-old. Another one he said to me is, why is there something and not nothing? Okay, that is one of the deepest philosophical and scientific questions that there is. In fact, scientists will refuse to go there. I had an extraordinary evening once judging a debate competition with a brilliant chemist called Peter Atkins, who's a professor at Oxford, wrote a wonderful book called Molecules, which is the kind of book that we read at QI. You know, it's just about molecules. It's really good. It's the best book on molecules I think there is. And um, after judging this debate, Peter and I went out for a couple of drinks, and I had a pint, and he had a glass of Chardonnay. And after three glasses of Chardonnay, Peter said to me, we, had, we started arguing about why there is something and not nothing. And he said, well, I don't know, but we will know soon. We'll know. We'll, we'll eventually know why there is something and not nothing. And I, 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 I disagreed. And, um, and he said, besides, it's not a question you can ask. Why is there something and not nothing? I said, why not? He said, well, it's not scientific to ask that. There isn't an, a scientific answer, because science is very good at how questions, but not very good at why questions, particularly not at these Questions at the end of what I call Y strings, which I call terminal Ys. Okay, a terminal Y is one to which there just isn't anything else to be said. We don't know why there's something and not nothing, and it's not the province of science to do it. He got very angry, Peter, after the fourth glass of wine. He said, I think these questions should be illegal. I, <laughs> literally, I think you should not be allowed under United Kingdom law to ask the question like, you know, why are we here, for example? So anyway, I, I, don't, uh, I don't agree with that because every language in the world that's ever been found has a word for why. Why, why do we have this, this word for why? Uh, so 
in terms of ignorance and its importance, um, Martin Rees, he's a very good guy. He's the Astronomer Royal. He's a lord and a knight and everything else. And he uh, says about the universe, it's embarrassing that 96% of the universe is unaccounted for. I'm sure some of you know that we only know where about 4% of the universe is. All the rest of it's stuff called dark matter and dark energy. We don't know what it is, what it's made of, or even where it is. And that's a kind of hopeless thing, isn't it? Our cosmology is based on a theory that is only right, can be proven 4% of the time. It's absolutely hopeless. Uh, a guy called Marcus Chown, very bright physicist, uh, told me the other day that even if they find the Higgs boson, this elusive particle that's supposed to be the answer to everything, it will actually only account for 1% of gravity. So we're all kind of looking in the wrong direction. And, and the thing is, once you realise how little we know, Edison, Thomas Edison used to say, we don't know 1% of one millionth about anything. And that is the case, because if I ask you, for example, to name all 5,000 or so species of mammals, you probably, you know, probably know about 40 of them. What about beetles? You know, a third of a million or more species of beetles. You probably could name maybe 10 of those. You might know this uh, story about the oracle at Delphi. But the only unambiguous pronouncement the oracle ever made was when uh, somebody, some friends of Socrates, went to uh, the oracle and asked, who is the wisest man in Athens? And the oracle said, Socrates. So they all rushed back to Athens and said, Socrates, why are you the wisest man in Athens? And he says, well, I don't know, but I think it's because I'm the only person in Athens who knows that he doesn't know anything. And that's the position that Socrates started from. And it's, if there's so many things, if we adopt ignorance, we say at QI, embrace the way of ignorance, okay? It's so freeing, it's so marvelous not to pretend that you know something. It's a very good remark made by Alice Wellington Rollings, who said, the mark of a good teacher is the number of questions they elicit from the children that they themselves cannot answer. And that is the most amazing thing. A teacher who says, I don't know, let's find out, is a complete hero. And that actually is the way that home education's done. It, I don't know. You know, my, my brother's got two kids who are home educated. They're, abs they're geniuses, without question. Gravity. Did you know they don't understand gravity? It's the least understood of all the four fundamental forces. They know more about what goes on inside an atom than they do about gravity. Electricity. Nobody knows how that works. I mean, they know that it works, they know how it works, they don't know why. Explosions is a thing. Nobody really understands what goes on in an explosion. I spent 40 years nearly in comedy. I have no idea why things are funny. I have the faintest notion. I was actually asked to be a professor of comedy at a university, and I said, I can't do that because nobody knows how it works or what it is. Uh, and so I opted to be a professor of ignorance instead, which I know a lot about. Um, Did so, so, accept you? Uh, well, uh, they did, but then they changed their mind. They don't want me to be called a professor of ignorance because it might associate the university with ignorance. <laughs> I said, that's the whole point. That's the, it's not just a joke. <laughs> it's not a joke. I mean, ignorance is what drives science. I mean, you, you wouldn't think it because if you read the public prints and you see scientists talking, they, people like Dawkins are very defensive. Peter Atkins is very defensive about science. You know, well, why is everyone getting at science? Scientists in private, they're all going, why is that then? That's a thing we don't know about. That's what makes science happen. Ignorance is at the heart of any kind of discovery. But one of the things is that knowing stuff gets in the way, right? This is crucially what I want to say. You don't need to know very much. There are only about six things I think you really need to know. Uh, one of them, which is, one is, one is be nice. Um, that's definitely, another one is don't be frightened. Uh, of which, of course, you can see I'm gibbering with terror up here. <laughs> I could go on talking forever, but I, I've... S wh where to go next, I'll let Matthew uh, decide. I did a, a, a thing with my father last night for Welcome Trust. It was kind of a weird thing. We all had to interview each other, and, we, and, the, and the subject was belief. And, um, and when I look to this notion of belief, it's quite interesting, really. I think the definition of belief is seeing something as valid or true, comma, especially in the absence of evidence. So it's, it's an interesting idea. 
So I was saying to him, because he's a Liverpool fan, I was saying, you know, what does belief really mean? If, I, if you said to me, I think Liverpool will qualify for the Champions League, I'd expect there to be evidence behind it, some facts, some analysis. If you said I have faith that Liverpool will qualify for the Champions League, I'd know it was just a reflection of your own kind of prejudices. But if you say, I believe Liverpool will qualify for the Champions League, it's quite an ambiguous phrase. And in the end, I came to the conclusion that belief is a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing. When we say we believe something, what we really mean is it's faith, but it's faith that we're going to try to claim is based upon reason. You're an atheist. Uh, I'm an atheist, but I'm an atheist who believes that we all have sacred beliefs. It's just that religious people have religious sacred beliefs and other people have different kinds of secular beliefs. And, and uh, sacred beliefs. When, when you say you, uh, you're an atheist, does that mean you're certain there is no deity? Uh, I, I'm, I, I pretty strongly believe that. <laughs> you? Okay, so... Um, I don't personally think that atheism is a tenable scientific position. That's where I come from. I think agnosticism is the only, if you must choose not to believe, agnosticism's good because we don't know. We don't know. And I once gave a talk, I've discovered this wonderful new faith called ignosticism, right? <laughs> and agnostics refuse to discuss the question of whether there's a God or not until the terms are defined. Okay, and I think there's... I come, come at faith a different way, which is QI is a faith. I wish we'd turned it into a religion. It's a very good one. It works. You know, it's, it's a popular religion. It doesn't have any deities kicking around, and there's no, no worshipping required, no robes are needed. But it's a faith because what we've discovered is that the universe does not give up its interestingness unless you behave virtuously. A, a good QI research has to be patient, brave, determined, Go on. Greedy, lazy researchers don't last at QI because they don't find anything interesting. There's so much stuff. And it's a very peculiar thing. And it's a very frightening thing doing QI research because often as not, you read a whole book. I once read a book on the history of Hull. Big book, 400 pages long. There was not one interesting thing in the entire <laughs> book. That's not possible, is it, to write a book? Because Hull is an amazing, you know, it's a big city. It's got a long history. There must be some interesting things about it. So QI is a faith, and you often lose your faith. This is why I understand what people mean by faith. You often get desperate with QI. You can't find anything, but you cling to the idea. I know I've done it before lots of times. My experience says, eventually, I will find something interesting about pomegranates, and lo and behold, it delivers. So it's a kind of working faith. People prefer facts to theories, because facts are easier to deal with yes. than, than, than theories. What's the relationship between how is it we get people to deal with difficult stuff? Well, I mean, for, for example, it's one of the things that I, I don't mean to be aggressive about the atheist thing, but, for example, Stephen, as you know, is a famous atheist, and he famously hates astrology. And you think, well, Stephen, this is not, uh, this is not a, um, uh, the, the equable, charming guy who's ready to listen and curious about anything. Astrology was invented by the Babylonians, okay? He also invented astronomy, and some say the very first telescope made of crystals. And they also invented mathematics, which is why we have 360 degrees in a circle and so on. So three things the Babylonians invented, astronomy, mathematics, and this thing called astrology. Well, obviously, two of them are correct, and one is not correct. That's not, again, it's not, it's, it's not that it's wrong. Uh, uh, it's just not a very interesting position to say, I mean, for example, I don't happen to believe there are little green men in spaceships. I don't believe in aliens. I don't think there is any of that stuff or nothing will ever reach. But I, I would never get cross with people who, who did believe in it. Who, I say, that's interesting. Let, let's hear a bit more about it. And, and so I, how do you then deal with the number of people out on the internet, for example, I think we say phrase, out on the internet, that shows my age, but, uh, you know, who, who, are, who, who are talking bollocks, basically, who are making stuff up, you know, the kind of thing that Ben Goldacre rails against. Yeah, but again, it's, Ben's a brilliant guy, and, and he's very, very good on things he knows about, um, uh, but there's, since nobody knows anything, as I've said, the, the best position is, um, I don't know about that. I'll tell you, sorry, I've got a friend who's a white Ghanaian chieftain, there's a few of them, okay, if, if, somebody who's not a Ghanaian does something amazing for the village, or if they're particularly well-liked, they get made an honorary chieftain, okay? And this guy's name is Johnny Carmichael. Um, he says the interesting thing about Ghana is that no Ghanaian, no ordinary working-class Ghanaian, would ever dream of expressing an opinion 
unless they had direct personal experience of it. So they're all happy to talk about building a house or cassava or plowing or you know, marriage or whatever. But unlike us, we all say, oh I, uh, yeah, I, I read a piece in the TLS and therefore I, it's now my opinion this. And it's a completely different thing. And most of the information we consume is very uh, secondhand. For example, there's a great stat I saw the other day. The, an ordinary daily edition of the New York Times contains more information than the average person in the 17th century would have consumed in a lifetime. That's how much information we're swamped with. And, and, and it's, there's so much of it, you need to know which are the important bits. And, and strong opinions like me and Peter arguing about why the universe began or the Big Bang Theory. For example, here's the thing. For many years, it has been impossible to get a job in astrophysics unless you sign up to the Big Bang Theory. They prefer you also to sign up to string theory, one of the 22 unprovable versions of it. But the Big Bang Theory is absolutely, people who say, I'm not sure it works, they're anathema. It's just started to collapse, the Big Bang Theory. I was on the radio with uh, Martin Rees the other day on, on the Infinite Monkey Cage, and he started to say, the Big Bang Theory is, uh, We've got little bangs as well. We may have big crunches. And we've even the steady state Fred Hoyle series starting to come back into favor, which I've been saying for 10 years, the Big Bang Theory doesn't work. And so now suddenly all these poor astrophysicists who couldn't get a job because they, and it's all going to turn around. And suddenly we'll all be saying, oh, the Big Bang Theory, that was then. And now there's something else. And, it, and information, information you know, changes continually over time. And it's a fascinating thing to me that people will get really, really cross about things they can't possibly ever know or prove, such as the existence of God at the beginning of the universe, but they let other things that are really important, like how to get on with your own children, pass. Because we're all hopeless at it, aren't we, really? Most people are hopeless at bringing up children. Not you, Matthew, and me, obviously, but that. <laughs> um, what's in your brilliant career has been the relationship between you getting bored with an idea and the public getting bored with an idea. You know, has it been that when you've worked on series that you've got to the point where you think, oh, I've got to grind out another one of these? Or has it been that uh, the public has said, well, we're not watching it so much, even though you were enthusiastic? Or, or have you and the public, generally speaking, been kind of together in this process? In terms of getting bored with stuff, you mean? Or? Yeah, I mean, I get the sense that most people would say, you know, Blackadder, we should have 5,000 series of Blackadder, and then it could be on 23 channels whenever you turn on the television well, rather than just on five, you know. But. On that very specific question, I tend to be, I'm somebody who, I'm not to call myself a visionary, but I have ideas that are slightly ahead of the curve. So all, all the first series I've done, I've basically been despised and hated by my friends for suddenly going into <coughs> puppeteering, you know, what the hell's Lloydy doing now, you know? Um, uh, a sitcom set in the Middle Ages, how the hell would that work? Sounds like Jimmy Edwards, you know? So, uh, and it takes a year or so for the audience to catch up. And then at the other end, uh, things start to go stale, and I can see they're going stale about three years before the commissioner <laughs> suddenly thinks, is it getting a bit flat, QI, do you think? It's just not quite as funny as it used to be, that kind of thing. So I don't know what that is. I'm slightly out of, out of phase with people. what have you learned about that arc? That, that, that takes you from the kind of innovation stage where no one quite gets it, but you do, to the point where it's all working brilliantly, to the point at which people still like it, but you kind of know, you can sense. You know, my experience is that my intuition in comedy, I've trusted it so much, I've been doing it for 40 years. To me, it's not an argument when I say, this will work, this won't work. It's not a matter of opinion. It's coming from somewhere else. It's like, where do ideas come from? They're not mine. I haven't taken credit for ideas for 15 years. Ideas are not mine. They, they're like, as somebody said, fish floating past, you know? Ideas, Edison said, come from space. And that's an interesting thing. Once you let go of the idea that they're your ideas, they're just an idea that you happen to be in the room when it connected with you, that becomes very interesting.